All right, so today we're going to be talking about ions. All right, now when we have an ion here, this is when the number of protons is not going to be equal to the number of electrons. Now there are two possibilities uh, for the ions here. Uh, one is that the number of protons is going to be greater than the number of electrons. And in this case, this is going to be positively charged. Okay, so these are positively charged, and we have a special little term for them, and these are called cations. So these are positively charged, they're called cations. The other possibility is if these things are negatively charged. So here the number of protons is going to be less than the number of electrons, so these are now going to be negatively charged, and we term these anions. All right, now of course if we want to know what the charge on a particular ion is, um, the charge is going to be equal to the number of protons minus the number of electrons. So remember the electrons are negatively charged, protons are positive, so number of protons minus number of electrons will tell us the overall charge um, on that. And then of course just you know for completeness here if you happen to have, let's break this up, uh, if the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons well this is just going to be a neutral atom. All right, so we talked about those earlier. So there's going to be no charge um, on these. Now, as a way to maybe help you remember the difference between a cation and an anion, um, look right here. This is the way I was taught way back in, in high school. Uh, notice right here the cation has the little T. The little T looks a lot like a plus sign. So that's how you can kind of remember the cation is positively charged. Um, and then the anion, the way they told us was here we have uh, the little cross part in the A that also looks like the negative sign here. So you can kind of remember the negative sign goes with the A with the anion, the little plus sign over here goes with the T for the cation. So if that helps, you know, great. So here we're gonna look at some uh, useful trends between uh, the cations and the anions here. All right, so cations are usually going to be metals. All right, so these are usually metals. And when I'm talking about metals, I'm referring to everything in gray here. Uh, the alkaline metals, the alkaline earth metals, transition metals, and the lanthanides and the actinides. The nonmetals will be the anions that we see later. As for the metalloids, they usually don't form ionic compounds, and most of the time we don't deal with them, so we can't put them in the category of either anions or cations. Um, also, these are going to be smaller than the parent ion. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's say I have here a sodium metal, and we can say this is sodium metal by putting a little superscript zero there, and that represents that the metal has no charge. So it's just the neutral metal itself. And then we can ionize this, and we can get here a sodium ion. So a little plus charge means that it's you know, lost its electron, that's its net charge. And then of course, to balance this out, we have the electron here. Now notice right here, this is zero charge on this side, that's plus one, that's minus one, so we have zero net charge on this side, so you know, our charges are balanced, everything is nice and happy. Now what we have here, the sodium ion, or the sodium metal atom, it's going to be, you know, relatively large. But then once it reacts to become the sodium ion, it's going to shrink up a little bit. And the reason for this is, in this um, sodium atom, if we want to look at what is um, actually going on here, we have 11 protons, uh, 12 neutrons for this particular isotope, and 11 electrons. Once this is ionized, we still have the 11 protons and 12 neutrons, because that's never going to change in a chemical reaction. But now we're only going to have 10 electrons. So think of it this way, if um, you got pickpocketed, um, so now you're going to be much more cautious and you're going to hold on to your money much tighter uh, than before, right? So over here, the sodium atom had its full complement of 11 electrons, it was nice and happy, living large. Um, suddenly one of its electrons got stolen and now it's going to hold on to the remaining 10 um, much tighter and because of that the atom is actually going to shrink down. Uh, so we have the same 11 protons pulling out only 10 electrons so that's why this thing here actually gets smaller. Alright now as for um, the charges that the ions can actually or the cations can actually have here, um, in theory you can lose everything. Okay. Okay, so theoretically you could lose all of your electrons. If you just supply enough energy uh, to the sodium atom, you can get, you know, a sodium plus 11 ion. No problem. But, 
but practically speaking, you're only going to lose a few. And that's because in a normal chemical reaction, you know, there's only a certain amount of energy available and you can't, you know, keep ripping electrons off because, you know, as you try taking more electrons off of this atom, it's going to hold on to the remaining even tighter and tighter and tighter. And, you know, it's going to be very difficult to uh, remove, you know, lots of electrons there. As for how many electrons actually do get removed, the uh, numbers vary anywhere from plus one to nine. So this is how many um, can be taken off. Generally, however, we're only going to have one or two, three or four. That's usually going to be the values you actually see. Occasionally, you know, we'll see more, you know, maybe a five or a six. But uh, generally, these are going to be the, the numbers we actually uh, work with. Okay, uh, next up are the anions. And like the cations are usually metals, these are usually going to be the nonmetals. So, of course, the nonmetals are, you know, the stuff up here in this corner. So, um, all your halogens, the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, um, your chalcogens, your oxygen, sulfur, um, then the nitrogen and phosphorus. You know, these are the ones you're generally going to be seeing to be the anions. Uh, the noble gases, um, you know, don't really form compounds, so we're not going to worry about uh, any charge with those. All right, and also, just like the cations were smaller, these are now going to be larger. So in this case, um, we can have here a chlorine atom, and I add on to this an electron, and this is going to make a chloride ion. So again, uh, how we can kind of visualize this and showing that this is going to be larger, well, here is my um, chlorine atom, like so. I add an electron to this, and now it is going to be a much larger chloride ion. And if we just look here at how many protons and electrons and everything this has, this has here 17 protons. Uh, 20 neutrons for this particular isotope, and then 17 electrons. Okay, so that's a nice neutral atom. Now, of course, I add an electron to this, so I'm still going to have my 17 protons and 20 neutrons, but now I'm going to have here 18 electrons. And what's going on in this case is, unlike this where the sodium, you know, is desperately holding on to its remaining ion, or electrons and it shrinks down, here I've added um, another electron. So unlike the guy who got pickpocketed, this one just won the lottery, and now he's living large, and you know his uh, his atomic size is, or his ionic size is much larger uh, than the atom he started with. Um, and the reason this actually happens here is because there is the electron-electron repulsion. So if you try adding another electron, it's going to start puffing up because those electrons don't like being next to each other because they're all the same charge, so they start repelling one another, and you actually get you know a larger uh, ion to form. Now, when we talked about the cations, we said that we could you know theoretically lose all of the electrons, but practically we, we only lose a few uh, for these. Um, for anions, there is a theoretical and a practical limit. And the reason for this is um, the electron-electron repulsion. So as you keep adding more electrons to this, let's say I wanted to add another electron to here, well, now it has to contend with these other 18 electrons, and it's going to get even puffier. You try sticking another one in there, it gets even puffier, and eventually, you know, the electrons are going to say, I don't have to deal with this, I can be free on my own instead of having to deal with all these, elect these other electrons, so they just leave, and you can't stick any more electrons on there. Um, it, they just blow apart because uh, the electron-electron repulsion. So there's a theoretical and a practical limit. You can't just keep sticking infinite amounts of, of electrons onto a particular atom. Now as for the charges of these anions, um, the usual values are anywhere from minus 1 um, all the way to minus 5. Although, again, the general ones that we're going to see is minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3. Occasionally you might see a minus 4 uh, stuck in there as well. There's one other uh, thing to mention here is when we're actually dealing with the ions, they have very different chemical properties than the atoms from which they came. So this sodium right here, uh, this is a metal. Okay, it's a shiny metal, it's solid, very reaction, uh, very large reactions with water. Um, you put this into water and you know it can explode on you. So uh, sodium, um, you, know, you do not want to be messing with this, it's highly, highly reactive. On the other hand, the sodium ion, um, that is present in, you know, basically pretty much everything that you eat. Um, when they put uh, salt in, it's actually something that's vital to life. So right here, um, sodium ion, this is vital to life. And also, it's stable in water. All right, and then down here, um, if we look here at the chlorine, well, again, um, well, chlorine, we actually don't have individual atoms. We actually have here uh, chlorine uh, molecules like this, but this is actually a green gas. All right, and actually it's very noxious as well. 
Okay, so it's a very noxious green gas. Um, you don't want to have to be uh, dealing with the chlorine gas. But again, um, when we're dealing with the chloride ion down here, um, again, this is something that's uh, vital and is stable in water. So the one point to take away from this is that some atoms may be extremely poisonous, but their ions are very beneficial. On the other hand, uh, some ions may be extremely poisonous and their atoms are actually not too bad. So it all depends on you know, how they actually uh, interact uh, with the system here. And we can't just say that, well, if this one is, is bad, we can't just you know, immediately say that the ion is going to be bad as well. So this is uh, something you have to be very careful of. A small piece of sodium metal is placed in a flask containing yellow chlorine gas. The flask also contains sand to prevent the heat which will be generated by the reaction from cracking the glass. Initially, no reaction is observed between the sodium and the chlorine. The reaction will be initiated by adding a drop of water to the sodium. Okay, now one important point is that if we're dealing with ionic compounds, and later on we start dealing with the naming of these, um, ionic compounds um, are going to be neutral, meaning that um, the number of positive things um, plus the number of negative things is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so all the positive charges and plus all the negative charges, um, when we combine the two things together, that's how we get neutral molecules. Uh, to actually form. So for instance, if I have here uh, sodium chloride, plain old table salt, uh, this of course you know is Na plus and a Cl minus. So plus one minus one, that's zero. So that's why we're never going to see Na2Cl or NaCl2 or anything like that. It's always just going to be plus one and a minus one here. Uh, next one, let's say we have calcium chloride. This is going to be the Ca plus two plus two Cl minuses. So I have uh, plus two over here, then minus one times two, and that's going to give me again a zero charge. So that's why this is the formula for calcium chloride. Um, aluminum chloride, AlCl3. So that's going to be an Al plus three, plus three chlorides. Okay, again, that's how we know it's neutral because, um, you know, this is plus three, there's three times negative one, that's going to be zero. Um, if I have here calcium oxide, so this is going to be uh, calcium plus two plus an oxygen, which we're going to be seeing, or oxide, which is going to be a negative two. And here, this is a little tricky one, Mg3N2, which is going to be three Mg plus two plus two N minus three. So in this case, that's three times two, that's six for this one, two times negative three, that's minus six, that again works out to be zero. And I probably should just write down what the names are uh, for these compounds here. So over here, this is of course sodium chloride, that's calcium chloride, aluminum chloride, calcium oxide, and magnesium uh, nitride. And we'll go through all the naming conventions uh, a little bit later on here. All right, so we're gonna go back here to the periodic table. And what we want to figure out is how do we know which atoms are going to be, you know, plus one, plus two, minus one, minus two, and, and so on. If we just look, all the atoms in each of these columns has very similar properties. So over here, everything in this column is actually going to be a plus one. Everything in this column is going to be a plus two. Um, now over here, these are the transition metals. Uh, these can take on multiple oxidation states. So we're going to treat those uh, separately. Um, over here in this column, these uh, tend to be plus three. Actually, the aluminum here usually is plus three. For these, we really usually don't have oxidation states for these, so don't worry about uh, the, calcium, or the carbon and silicon and so on. Um, but over here, the fluorines, these are going to be your minus one, your oxygens and stuff, these are going to be your minus two, and your nitrogens are going to be your minus three. So that's why when I was talking about these particular compounds here, notice here, my sodium was plus one, my calcium was, or my, bleh. My sodium was plus one, my chlorine was a minus one. So right here is my sodium, it's in the first column, it's gonna be a plus one. My chlorine over here is um, in this column, so that's why it's the negative one. Um, again, here is the calcium, that's in the second column, so this is going to be a plus two. And again, here is my chlorine, which is going to be the negative one. And really, I could have chosen any of these, fluorine, bromine, iodine, any of these are going to be a negative one charge. 
And then here's the aluminum, that one's going to be your plus three, and over here again, their chloride I had was the minus one. Um, here's that calcium oxide, well like we said before, calcium was plus, or plus two, and then over here, the oxygen, this is going to be a negative two for that case. And then here I have the magnesium nitride, well here's the magnesium, so that's in that second column, so it's going to be a plus two, and then here is the nitrogen, um, which is over the third from the left here, which is going to be the minus three. That's how we know that. All right, now why do we have you know these particular charges for them? Uh, this gets a little bit uh, further on into you know the whole electronic structure of the periodic table, but the basic thing here is that um, all of these atoms over here want to attain this noble gas configuration. Because of course the noble gases, the reason they call them this is because they don't form chemical compounds. There are some exceptions with the ones down here, but we're not going to worry about that uh, for the moment. But things like helium, neon, and argon, um, these don't form any chemical compounds. That, well, argon forms one, but it breaks down as soon as you reach like 10 degrees above absolute zero, so we don't really worry about that one too much. Um, but basically they want to attain this noble gas configuration. So notice right here, let's say my fluorine, this has nine electrons, it needs one more electron, that's why the fluorine is going to be a negative one, have the fluoride ion. My oxygen needs two electrons to do that. Goes over here, that's why it's to make the neon, that's why it's an oxygen negative two. My nitrogen needs three electrons to do that, right? Seven, eight, nine, ten, right? So it needs three electrons, that's why my nitride is a negative three. And same thing down here, my phosphorus, my sulfur, my chlorine, you know, they're all going to need, you know, here's my negative three, my negative two, my negative one for this to actually work. Um, same thing here with the selenium and the bromine, that's going to be minus two, minus one, and then the iodine is going to be a minus one as well. So that's why, you know, they follow these pretty nice rules here. All right, and then same thing over here on this side. Uh, to attain the uh, noble gas configuration, this has one extra electron versus the neon, or versus the helium. So it's going to just lose one electron. And the same thing here with the sodium, this has one extra electron. Uh, my potassium, my rubidium, my cesium, my francium, all these have one extra electron, so they're all going to lose one electron and become the noble gas over here. Then everything over here in this column, uh, these are going to lose two electrons to attain the noble gas configuration. Uh, now when we get to the uh, stuff over here with the transition metals, um, these over here tend to be like a minus three, but um, there's some other subtleties going on here. Um, this kind of gets back to what I was talking about. Um, you know, there's practically, you can only lose a few. So, I mean, if we're dealing here with like, you know, copper or zinc, you know, we're not going to be losing all of the electrons because it, you can't rip all of them off like that. So there's going to be these other subtleties involved and we'll worry about that, um, why that actually happens, you know, later on in the class. And then down here, these can also take multiple oxidation states uh, as well. Here is a periodic table showing some of the common oxidation numbers. It is not complete, but good enough for the elements we'll typically see in this class and in your life. As you can see, all the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, are plus one. Hydrogen, though technically not an alkali metal since it is, you know, not a metal, it's a gas, is also commonly found as the plus one ion. Uh, the alkaline earth metals, magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium, are plus two. And aluminum, there's no name for that particular group, but is a plus three. On the other side, we see that the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, are minus one. The chalcogens, um, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium are minus two, and the panictogens, nitrogen, and phosphorus are a negative three. As for the transition metals in column three through column 12, uh, you can see multiple oxidation states. This isn't at all inclusive, um, but these are you know, pretty much the common ones. So notice that iron and cobalt are plus two and plus three, copper is plus one or plus two, uh, tin and lead are going to be plus two or plus four. Now zinc is pretty much always going to be plus two and silver is pretty much always plus one. But if you look hard enough, you can find some compounds which have uh, different oxidation states. So I'll stop it there and uh, the rest will be taken up when we start talking about uh, naming of the compounds.